Well, good morning. Let's pray. Let's ask for God's help. Father, we pray this morning that you would please speak to our hearts. Please give us understanding. Please soften our hearts so that we would all recognize Jesus for who he is, the king of the universe. We pray this in his name. Amen. Well, July 14th, 1789, an armed mob of revolutionaries stormed the Bastille, the castle in Paris, the place that symbolized the king's rule. It was obviously a critical moment in the French Revolution. And at that time, of course, many supported the French Revolution, which will be celebrated this coming Thursday, but not everyone. Edmund Burke, for example, an Irishman, staunchly opposed it. He wrote against it. And Psalm 2 is kind of an Edmund Burke of a psalm. It's writing to convince us of the folly of revolution. I wonder if the government's listening, and they'd be very uh, disturbed right now at the beginning of the sermon, talking about revolution. But what I'm talking about is not uh, French Revolution or our country's story. The attempt to overthrow the government is central to humanity's story. It's the story of human history. It's the unfolding drama between God and man. Genesis 1 to 3 records how God, the loving king of his creation, planted our first parents in a bountiful garden, overflowing with goodness, no reason to revolt. But of course, our first parents listened to Satan's lie, sought to overthrow God's good rule, and brought misery and death into the world. But God in his goodness promised to send his king a human ruler who would reestablish God's good rule, rescue us from Satan's tyranny, and bless all nations. And that is news worth singing about. In fact, we do sing about it at Christmas time when we sing, Joy to the world. The king is here. He's come to make his blessings flow as far as the curse is found. He's not a cruel tyrant. The king of Psalm 2 is the blessed man of Psalm 1. Just look at Psalm, well, if you have a Bible, look at Psalm 1, verse 1. The king is the man who delights in the law of the Lord. So you'd think, well, maybe the nations will respond to him with open arms, not clenched fists. But no, history repeats itself, or at least it rhymes, as Mark Twain puts it. The, the um, rebellion in Eden you can see in Psalm 2, it's gone international. Now, Psalm 2 is unique in the way it's anti-revolution literature, because this is not the opinion of an Irishman. It's God's answer to the revolutionaries who opposed his king. And from this psalm, we learn how to live in such a world, how to respond to God. The psalm, you can kind of see it divides into four stanzas. The first is in 1 to 3, where we see... We can summarize it as the united nations, united in rebellion against God's king. In verse 1, the psalmist asks rhetorically, why? Why do the Gentile nations rage and the people's plot and notice it's in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, his king, saying, here's what they say, verse 3, let us burst their bonds apart and cast away their cords from us. Let us break free from their chains. Let's throw off their ropes. It's the sort of thing a rebellious teenager or teenagers might say, talking about their loving parents or the attitude of the defiant 18-month-old who delights in breaking free from her mother. And every one of our hearts naturally rebels, of course. You will not rule me, God. That's slavery. Let's liberate ourselves from all restraint. Now, just think about the world for a moment. How is that working out for us? There was an article in the Atlantic earlier this year, teenage depression is at an all-time high in the United States. It's broken lives, shattered relationships, social chaos, 
And here in Psalm 2, the scope of the rebellion is global. The world's political rulers conspire to overthrow God's good rule. And in the original context, of course, the neighboring Gentile rulers conspired to overthrow the rule of God's King David, who had subdued nearby nations. But this deep-seated hostility and resentment towards God's rule characterizes rulers of any age, including today. Whether rulers of democratic republics or dictatorships, it doesn't really matter. And the clearest expression of this rage against God, shaking our fists at God, occurred at the cross, in the crucifixion of Jesus the King. And please uh, don't take my word for this. It's right there in Acts 4. It's printed in uh, below our outlines, if you want to look at it here. The rulers in Jerusalem threatened the apostle Peter and his friends to stop speaking the news of Jesus. And so you can see verse 23, though, that's part of Peter's prayer. They pray for boldness. And Peter, you can see, he quotes Psalm 2, and look what he says, verse 27. Truly in this city, Jerusalem, they were gathered together against your holy servant Jesus, whom you appointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the peoples of Israel, to do whatever your hand and your plan had predestined to take place. See, Jesus, the long-awaited king, he arrives to bring blessing. And what happens? Well, people from very different backgrounds unite against God's king. Mark 3, 6, uh, Mark 3, 6 nationalistic Pharisees and establishment Herodians who hated each other they conspire, they unite, they take counsel together to plot to destroy King Jesus. And not just then, of course. Today, hostility directed towards Jesus is taken out on his people. Authoritarian regimes persecute and kill Christians, of course. But Western leaders may not be as brutal as those guys, but they work to oppose Jesus' rule, don't they? It would not be surprising if EU leaders in Brussels further seek, they're already doing it, further seek to criminalize speech that they hate because it challenges their secular values and could outlaw speaking the gospel or at least the ethical implications of the gospel. There's plenty of rebellion expressed through legislation. We call it bureaucratic rebellion. And there are some surprising alliances, I'm sure you've noticed. Isn't it interesting how some Western leaders who oppose real Christianity, that is very clear, they do, they oppose real Christianity, and yet they seem surprisingly pro-Islam. Even though Islam's view of women's rights is antithetical to a secular worldview, they clash like oil and water, those two things. So why the sympathy for Islam, but hatred for Christianity? It could be a number of things, but could it be just Psalm 2? playing out today. And we could talk about all sorts of other things going on, but as Christians, it's easy to respond wrongly to this kind of revolutionary spirit of the age and either cave in and follow our old rebellious hearts, go back to that, or just be consumed with worry. A lot of us are worried today, what's going on with the world? But notice that key word in verse two, in vain. Do they resist God's king? Resistance is futile. It is doomed to fail. And God is not overwhelmed by what's going on. You know, a friend recently said, often our problems, our problem is that we have too high a view of man and too small a view of God. And that is exactly right. We may feel overwhelmed, but what does God think of these powerful rulers Powerful nations, all of them, raging against him. Well, notice, secondly, what he does. He laughs. This is the God who laughs, verses 4 to 6. And don't you love this picture in verse 4? Just look at these words. He who sits, he doesn't even leave his throne. He's, not, he's unfazed by this. He sits on his throne in heaven and laughs unmoved. And notice the contrast between heaven and earth. 
Heaven laughs at the little earthly rulers shaking their little fists at him. For this illustration, you're going to have to use your imagination. Imagine, imagine a civilization of ants is plotting to overthrow you and take over your house. And so the most distinguished ants, the officials, travel from as far away as go for ice cream to gather together for a grand conference under that bush over there, a great meeting of the minds and strategizing and conspiring to overthrow you. And as you stand above them listening in, you laugh at the absurdity of it. Now, the one point there is we're not ants, we're made in God's image, but the point is heaven laughs. It's obviously language accommodated to us to make the point that human plans to overthrow God and his king are absurd. They are laughable. Notice God not only laughs, his attitude towards this rebellion, but he speaks. He speaks a terrifying word to his enemies. Verse six, as for me, I, God, and the I is emphatic, I have set my king on Zion, my holy hill. God has installed, he's enthroned his king. And there's nothing his enemies can do about it. Interesting here, God announces news, gospel, to his enemies. And it's instructive for us, isn't it? See, how should we answer a world that is raging against God? Well, we don't have to come up with an answer. God has already answered by speaking his gospel. And we're to speak that same gospel that God speaks in verse 6. The good news that God has installed his king, his name is Jesus Christ, the king. This is liberating. There is no need to correct everyone's uh, view. There is no need to form an answer to every cultural problem or lash out in anger. We just speak God's gospel. Jesus is king. Now, you might wonder, I, I thought about this, why is it such terrifying news? It's good news. Well, of course, this news that Jesus is king, it is terrifying to these rulers who are revolting against God's king. Think about it. Imagine the, the terror a rebel feels when he hears the news that the king that he's attempted to overthrow has ascended to the throne. See, if you plot against the king, as someone has said, you better not miss. And when the rulers crucified King Jesus, they thought they took him out. And if it was any other king, they'd be spot on. They'd be right. But he is God's king. And so God raised him from the dead. Psalm 2 speaks of God installing his anointed king, David, who took over Mount Zion by conquering the Jebusites. But of course, David's reign foreshadows the reign of David's son, Jesus, the Messiah. God's king began his reign from an unimpressive hill in Judah. But his rule extends to the ends of the earth, even here in Greenwich. And we see that in this third stanza. We see that Jesus is the universal king. Now, I'm going to have to do some hard work here just for a moment. As the youth group can tell you, they've been being trained in how to read the Bible. Whenever we come across a pronoun, we need to ask who it refers to. So look at verse 7. The I in verse 7 refers to the Messiah. So I, the king, will tell of the decree. And the king reads aloud the decree that God the Father spoke to him and about him. And of course, when God makes a decree, an authoritative decision, it is done. It will happen. It is set in stone. Well, what has God decreed? That his son, his king, will be enthroned as sovereign ruler of the nations, all nations. The end of the earth, the ends of the earth belong to him. And we know from reading the Gospels that Jesus is God's chosen king. At Jesus' baptism, at his transfiguration, God spoke. He said, this, Jesus, is my beloved son. But you might be confused by verse 7. 
We know from elsewhere in scripture that Jesus is the eternal son, God the son, one with the father from all eternity. And so what's going on in verse seven, it seems to imply that he became the son on a certain day. Because it says, today I have begotten you. What's the deal? Well, the confusion is removed when we realize that my son in verse seven refers not to Jesus's divine nature, but to his royal office, his title. Just as a board might appoint you CFO or CEO of the company, God has appointed Jesus to the highest office. The man who was crucified in weakness has been crowned son of God, the king of all nations. That's what it means. Now, on what day was Jesus declared to be the powerful king of God's kingdom? Well, it was on the day he rose from the dead. If you want cross-references, Acts 13, 33, also Romans 1, verse 4. In Acts 13, 33, the Apostle Paul says, verse 7 of Psalm 2, refers to Jesus' resurrection from the dead. Jesus, who ascended to heaven's throne, his eternal king, notice his promise in verse 8, that he's going to inherit all nations, possess the ends of the earth. Christianity is not parochial. Jesus's reign is universal. That's why uh, you notice each week we pray for God's world and we pray for mission partners around the world. And you know, some uh, criticize missionaries for sharing the gospel in foreign lands. I've been criticized myself. Who do you think you are to come here and disrupt this culture? I listened to a talk online, a religious leader in a nearby church, horrified. This guy was horrified at Brazilian Christians seeking to convert tribes in the Amazon. How dare they, those evangelicals? And the speaker obviously doesn't believe Psalm 2. What is the missionary's response to the criticism? How dare you come here and speak of this King Jesus? Well, the response is respectfully, maybe with a nice smile on your face, to say, I'm nobody. But Jesus is the sovereign King. He is risen from the dead. And God has declared that he will inherit all nations, including all the people here made in his image. And actually the King sent me through a local church, the king sent me to announce this great news of his gracious rule so that you, sir, and everyone who hears it might turn to him and enjoy forgiveness and everlasting life. Jesus rules all nations. The theme of our Sunday Bible Club next week is around the world. And the kids will be traveling around the world to celebrate different countries. There's a rumor that Pikachu might even pop in to say hello and hear the gospel. We want them to learn that the gospel is inclusive of all nations because all nations belong to this one King, Jesus Christ. But here's the thing. When Jesus returns, he will not be welcomed by all with open arms. Don't expect that. But with clenched fists. He will return to a world that would crucify him again if we could. And so how will he inherit the ends of the earth? Well, this is going to challenge kind of Western sentimentality about Christianity, but Jesus will fully enforce his kingly rule with overwhelming force. Verse 9, it's very clear to understand verse 9. You shall break them with a rod of iron and dash them into pieces like a potter's vessel. It's a vivid picture, isn't it? It would make for a memorable Sunday school craft that I think the boys would at least would enjoy. Let's make a clay pot. Now take this iron rod and give the pot a good whack and see how many pieces it obliterates into. When Jesus returns, he will shatter all rebels like that. And if you're worried, that's not one of the games at the upcoming Bible club, but it could be. And again, it may seem harsh, but ask believers suffering in Myanmar or China or Iran or Nigeria, whose family members have been tortured for their allegiance to Christ, or ask those suffering the ravages of war. If Jesus has returned to smash 
self-enriching warmongers is good news to them. See, Jesus is the sovereign, universal king. He will establish his reign to the ends of the earth. God has decreed it. This is where history is headed. And so we should view history, including global events, through a Psalm 2 lens. When a country collapses, when a ruler is dethroned, right now Sri Lanka, they're going through some sort of uprising, or borders open up and there's a mass migration, there's a bigger story going on. It might just be that God is at work, sovereignly getting people to a place where they can hear the good news of Jesus, the sovereign king. Now, if verse 9 is where this psalm ended, we would all be doomed. We might as well go home and do who knows what. But every one of us, see, left to ourselves, resist his rule. We're his enemies by nature, left to ourselves. But in the final stanza, verses 10 to 12, there's this wonderful surprise. God surprises his enemies. God is full of surprises. He offers his enemies, these rulers, mercy and promises blessing upon all who give up their foolish rebellion and surrender to Jesus' rule. Jesus is the one and only refuge. This is the fourth and final point. Just see it for yourself at the end of verse 12. Blessed, happy are all who take refuge in him, in the king. Now, this is amazing. God offers mercy to the very rulers plotting to overthrow him in verse 2. If you were a king or a queen, some of us think we are, if you were a king or a queen and your enemies attempted to assassinate you, and bring you to the guillotine, and they missed, how would you respond? Well, most rulers would, of course, execute treasonous rebels immediately. Nelson Mandela, the first president of post-apartheid South Africa, he ascended to power in 1994, and during apartheid, uh, white rule, he suffered in jail on an island off Cape Town for 27 years. And when released, some assumed that he would take vengeance on his political opponents. There's lots of talk about civil war, apparently. And surprisingly, and some would even say miraculously, Mandela did not treat his enemies the way they deserved. He forgave them. And everyone in the world acknowledges that it was noble of him to do that. How much more noble of King Jesus to swap places with his enemies? What other king would be willingly crucified, suffer the death penalty for the very people who are attempting to overthrow his rule, for treasonous rebels like us, so that in him we can be forgiven? There's no other king like him. He's unlike every other king, not just because he's immeasurably more powerful than the rest, but he's immeasurably merciful. And he offers mercy to his enemies and he motivates his enemies to receive his offer with two things, a carrot and a stick, a warning of judgment and a promise of happiness. Stick and carrot, first the stick, he says, be warned, be wise, serve the Lord with fear. Become his servant. He's speaking to the kings. Yes, you, mighty kings. Yes, you, President Biden. Yes, you, Miss Merkel, and everyone else. Kiss the sun. In the Middle East, when a victorious king conquered a rival, the, the subdued king could surrender himself to the victorious king. And if he surrendered, the ruling king would say, well, king so-and-so kissed my feet. He submitted to my rule. Well, the psalmist says to us today, submit to God's king, Jesus Christ. Accept his rightful rule over us. See, those who refuse to accept his, his rule willingly now will still be ruled by him. But the unrepentant rebel will face the king's fury, will perish. No one wants to be the clay pot facing an iron rod. And so he says, be wise, O kings. And then there's the carrot to motivate us 
in verse 12, he says, how blessed, how happy, how joyful are all who take refuge in him. Many people think, you know, if I submit to King Jesus, he'll make my life miserable. I think Dan shared this about his, before his conversion. Obviously changed his mind because he realized life under his rule is not slavery, but true freedom because of the kind of king he is. Jesus himself is the only refuge, the only shelter from judgment, who will shelter every rebel, no matter how rebellious we've been, every rebel who asks him for forgiveness. And so with that in mind, let me close. You know, if you lived amid the French Revolution or any revolution, how would you decide which group to side with? Well, two questions. If you only cared about preserving your life, the only question you'd ask is, well, who's gonna win? The king or the revolutionaries? If you wanted to do what's honorable, you would also ask, well, which side is righteous? The king or is the revolutionaries? And in history, it's not always clear. But amidst this worldwide revolution against God, isn't it obvious who to side with? It is a no brainer. Because in Jesus, these two questions have one clear answer. You want to do what's honorable? We'll take refuge in God's king, Jesus, the legitimate king, the good king. You want to preserve your life forever? We'll take refuge in Jesus, the victorious king who cannot be defeated. He's already won. Resistance is futile. It's in vain. In vain do the nations plot against him. He is the sovereign king. The ends of the earth belong to him. And he says in this last verse, blessed are all who take refuge in him. Let's pray. Father, we're so thankful that you have opened our eyes to see Jesus for who he is, that we who were once your enemies have become your friends by your grace. Help us to keep taking refuge in Jesus Christ. Help us to keep proclaiming him to the ends of the earth. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.